Hey everybody, I am here for Am I Madlock? Not, not Am I Madlock. Why did I say that? I don't know why. I am actually here. I'm not here to show off books. I'm not. Um, I'm here for Fresh New Voice of YA uh, excerpt vlog featuring The Dark Divine by Bree Despain. And I hope I s said that correctly. Um, today. And unfortunately, I don't have the physical book with me at the moment. Um, uh, just right now, I just have um, chapter one online from Bree's site, and that's really about it. Um, I should be getting the book hopefully in the next day or so. It's um, I'm taping, I'm recording this on Sunday, the 13th, so hopefully I should be here Monday or Tuesday. Sharon is so kindly letting me borrow her copy, and so I'll be reading it this week and getting a review up by Saturday. So, um, anyway. I will go ahead and get started. Um, she has Bree suggested that I read um, starting on page 11, but I'm going to start just a little ahead of that. Actually, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm just lying to you all the time. I'm just lying to you in this vlog so many times. I don't mean to. Um, that was just a possibility I was going to do. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to start where she told me to start, and I'm going to extend the ending. <laughs> and just go to the end of the first chapter, okay? So, I'm on page 11, and, um, I mean, not a whole lot of has happened, just some mysteries, you know, kind of come up. Um, Grace was at school that day, and, um, a childhood friend of hers who had left several years ago, um, has come back, like, he disappeared, nobody knows what happened, and he's back, you know, with nobody new, and then he just shows up at school, and, um, but, uh, his childhood friend Daniel is a topic that none of her family wants to talk about, and she knows nothing about what happened with his disappearance, and, you know, and so there's a lot of sort of mystery things going on, so, um, and I'm going to go ahead and just get started. Cold air seeped through my thin cotton sweater. I was about to go inside when Jude took my hand in his. Gracie, will you promise me something? What? If you see Daniel again, promise me you won't talk to him. But listen to me, he said. Daniel is dangerous. He isn't the person he used to be. You have to promise to stay away from him. I twisted my fingers in the yarn of the blanket. I'm serious, Grace. You have to promise. Okay, fine. I will. Jude squeezed my hand and looked off into the distance. It seemed like he was staring a million miles away, but I knew his gaze rested on the weathered walnut tree, the one I'd been trying to draw in art class, that separated our yard from the neighbors. I wondered if he was thinking about that night three years ago when, we la when he last saw Daniel, the last time any of us saw him. What happened? I whispered. It had been a long time since I'd had the nerve to ask that question. My family acted like it was nothing. But nothing wasn't bad enough to explain why Charity and I were sent away to our grandparents for three weeks. Families don't stop talking about something that was nothing. Nothing didn't explain the thin white scar like the ones on his hand above my brother's left eye. We are not supposed to say bad things about the dead, Jude mumbled. I shook my head. Daniel isn't dead. He is to me. Jude's face was blank. I'd never heard him talk like that before. I sucked in a breath of, frig of frigid air and stared at him, wishing I could read the thoughts behind his stony eyes. You know you can tell me anything. No, Gracie, I really can't. His words stung. I pulled my hand out of, out of breath. I didn't know how else to respond. Jude stood up. Leave it alone, he said softly as he draped the afghan around my shoulders. He went up the steps, and I heard the screen door click shut. The television's blue light flickered through the front window. A large black dog padded across the deserted street. It stopped under the walnut tree and looked up in my direction. The dog's tongue lolled out in a pant, its eyes fixed on me, glinting with blue light. My shoulders collapsed with a shiver, and I shifted my gaze up to the tree. It had snowed before Halloween, but that had all melted away a few days later, and it probably wouldn't snow again until Christmas. In the meantime, everything in the yard was crusty and brown and yellow, except for the walnut tree, which creaked in the wind. It was white as ash and stood like a wavering ghost in the light of the full moon. Daniel had been right about my drawing. 
the branches were all wrong, and the knot in the lowest one should have been turned up. Mr. Barlow had asked us to illustrate something that reminded us of our childhood. All I could see was that old tree when I looked at my piece of paper, but in the past three years I had made it a point to avert my eyes when I passed it. It hurt to think about it, to think about Daniel. Now, as I sat on the porch, watching that old tree sway in the moonlight, it seemed to stir my memories until I couldn't help remembering. The afghan slipped off my shoulders as I stood. I glanced back at the front room window and then to the tree. Excuse me. The dog was gone. It may sound weird, but I was glad that dog wasn't watching as I went around to the side of the porch and crouched between the barberry bushes. I braved the nasty scratch on my hand as I felt under the porch for something I wasn't even sure was there anymore. My fingertips brushed something cold. I reached further in and slid it out. The metal lunchbox felt like an ice block in my bare hand. It was spotted with rust, but I could still make out the faded Mickey Mouse logo as I wiped years worth of grime off the lid. It came from a time that seemed so long ago. It used to be a treasure box where Jude, Daniel, and I kept our special things like pogs and baseball cards and that strange long tooth we found in the woods behind the house. But now it was a small metal coffin, a box that held the memories I wished would die. I opened the lid and pulled out a tattered leather sketchbook. I flipped through the, rest the musty pages until I found the last sketch. It was of a face I had drawn over and over again because I could never get it right. He had hair so blonde it was almost white then, not shaggy and black and unwashed. He had a dimple in his chin and a wry, almost devious smile, but it was his eyes that always eluded me. I could never capture their deepness with my simple pencil strokes. His eyes were so dark, so deep, like the rich mud we used to sink our toes into at the lake. They were mud pie eyes. I'm going to check time before I get into this next section. Let's go for it. <laughs> You want it? Come and get it. Daniel tucked the bottle of turpentine behind his back and lunged sideways like he was going to run away. I crossed my arms excuse me, and leaned against the trunk of the tree. I'd already chased him through the house, across the front yard, and around the walnut tree a couple of times, all because he had sneaked into the kitchen while I was working and stole my bottle of paint remover without saying a word. Give it back now. Kiss me, Daniel said. What? Kiss me, and I'll give it back. He fingered the moon-shaped knot in the lowest branch of the tree and flashed me a devious grin. You know you want to. My cheeks flamed. I wanted to kiss him with all the longing in my eleven-and-a-half-year-old heart, and I knew he knew it. Daniel and Jude had been best friends since they were two, and I, only a year younger, had trailed behind them since I was old enough to walk. Jude never minded when I wanted to tag along. Daniel hated it. But then again, only a girl could play Queen Amidala to Daniel's Anakin and Jude's Obi-Wan Kenobi. And despite all Daniel's teasing, he was my first real crush. I'll tell, I said lamely. No, you won't. Daniel leaned forward, still grinning. Now kiss me. Daniel! His mother shrieked from the open window of his house. You better come clean up this paint! Daniel shot straight up, his eyes wide with panic. He looked at the bottle in his hand. Please, Grace, I need it. You could have asked in the first place. Get in here, boy! His father roared out the window. Daniel's hand shook. Please. I nodded and I ran toward his house. I hid behind the tree and listened to his father yell at him. I don't remember what Daniel's father said. It wasn't his words that ripped me open. It was the sound of his voice, getting deeper and more like a vicious snarl as he went on. I sank into the grass with my knees pulled up to my chest and wished I could do something to help. That was almost five and a half years before I saw him in Barlow's class today. It was two years and seven months before he disappeared, but only one year before he came to live with us. One year before he became our brother. And that is what I've got. So that's the end of the chapter. And I really hope you enjoyed listening, listening and watching to the, watching this. And um, Bree's book, The Dark Divine, is coming out from Egmont, USA. Um, next Tuesday, December 22nd, so be sure to go get a copy, and I don't think I mentioned this in the Stupid Cupid one, um, that I recorded the other day, um, but that also comes out December 22nd, so be sure to get, go, just go and get both books on December 22nd, and curl up and read them over the holidays, so, um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it, and keep an eye out for all the other fun things coming up in Fresh New Voice of YA Week.
here at Bookchief. All right.